What's up, you guys? We're back um, with In Totality. We are back with part two. I have my brother here. Tony Gaskin is here. Um, I, I, I say he's the relationship guru, but he won't, he won't say that. Um, but a relationship... I'm trying to think... Not expert. I'm trying to think of a better word to use. Um, he guides people how to have healthy relationships using wisdom. So we're super thankful. We're back with part two. Um, I know I kind of left off on a, on a uh, cliffhanger. I wish I would have had better conversations. I wish I would have up front, not in the middle of it. I wish I would have had better ones up front. I wish I would have said it, you know, said things in, like in my marriage. I wish I would have been more... Um, honest about the real impact that it was having not just the surface impact but like the real deep internal impact that certain things were having on me not even just regarding him but just regarding life in general you know what I mean mm -hmm. um why didn't you I feel like I think maturity just not mature you know what I mean like as much I I, I had three kids by the time I was 24 that's a lot. Like, I don't think people are honest about, that's a lot. Going from 19 being pregnant and having a baby every other year or to every two, that's a lot. Hormones are changing. I'm changing. I'm only 24. I think about Jordan. She's turned, she turned 23 today and she's a baby. Like, you know what I mean? Not a baby, but I'm just like, man, that's so baby. young. Yeah. Compared, like, when I think about where I am now to then, it's like, wildly different and I had three little babies you know what I mean like I didn't have time to ask the right questions I didn't even have time to think about what the right questions were to ask I was trying to be a good mom to those boys I was trying to you know what I mean participate in the marriage and did you want to have that many kids that fast I think I did I wanted them all back to back to back to back like I did but I didn't realize the impact that it would take on my mental health, you know, on my hormones, I had no idea. We talked about that, like preaching and practicing, like mm -hmm. like wanting something and not knowing the reality of it. The backside of the responsibility. Right. Yeah. Now, did you want family that bad? Like, yeah, what? I always wanted to be married with kids, always. And so you wanted it that bad. Yeah. And so that's, you brought it, and mm -hmm. then when you got it, you was like, whoa, this was is not, not what, the book said. The and not and not only that, Tony, I wasn't, per, like, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this because I'm not, again, you know how the internet does. I think, and I'm trying to be very careful at how I say this because humans, the space that I am in now, right, as far as my relationship with God, my knowledge of him, my experiences lately that I've had with him, um, the way he's been able to illuminate his word for me. If I had this type of endurance, knowledge, and wisdom when I was married, in the beginning, like in the very beginning, I think that it could have motivated him in a way that would have produced better fruit. I think that I was not mature enough, nor did I have the understanding of what a wife's position truly is to steward what I had better. And I think same for him. I don't think we were aware of the responsibility, the um, the work, the 
position that each of us had, like the responsibilities that each of us had, not just in the home, but just spiritually what our responsibilities were. And I think having that understanding and having that knowledge would have probably eliminated a lot of heartache hmm. on both sides. Right. I think if we could do it over and we could do <clears> it right, I don't think anybody should be focused on dating before 25. And I would agree. Some have even said that we aren't fully developed mentally. Like our brain isn't mm -hmm. fully developed until 25. And I've always said before I heard that, that a man isn't a man until 25. Mm -hmm. Like that's the beginning of mm -hmm. manhood. And then I hear women say, well, I mean men who ain't a man at 60, you know, ain't a man at, so when you think about it, what you had on you, that's like death row. Mm -hmm. Meaning when you're 24 and you're raising three children, that's like one of the most, that's the hardest place to be in the world because yeah. it's women who are 40 who can't handle three kids. Yeah. So here you are, 24, you still a baby. Yeah. But you got this full on marriage. So it's different in a situation like that. That's when I would have an exception to the rules to say, well, you need to be with a man that's 10 years older than mm -hmm. you. Was he much older or was he similar No, age? he was older. I think that we just had... How much older? Six years. Yeah, that ain't enough. Because at that, 24 years old with three kids, you need a man 15 years older than mm. you. And you still going to have a headache on your hands. So when you say it would be better to date after 25, right? But... Our grandparents and their parents, they were dating young. They were dating at, you know, getting married some at 15, 16. Right. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have universities mm -hmm. that they could get into. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the technology, the technology we have, those mm -hmm. advancements. So it was a different time. It was a different world. Like we, we're in a place now to where we pretty much either have to go to university or you have to start a business at 18. Mm -hmm. Like pick your poison mm -hmm. and if you are focused on relationships like I'm coaching a 21 year old right now and I'm like you are going through way too much at 21 mm -hmm. with this toxic man <laughs> who is also 21 mm -hmm. when you should be when y'all both are in school I'm like mm -hmm. this way too much because y'all stressing me out <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm the 39 coach. right and married and, and it's just I think that's what we have to start to put the two together, mm -hmm. that the dream and the reality. Yeah. And I and that is what I mean by all of these stipulations that we have that are preferences mm -hmm. and we don't understand standards mm -hmm. and the difference between standards and preferences. That's what's breaking us down because we are literally in la la land. It's fairy tale. Yeah. Like men want a woman that God has not created. And women want a man that God has not created. Mm. And all of it is rooted in selfish desire. Yeah, None of it is rooted in seeing the bigger picture for the human race. Yeah. In God's kingdom. Everything's so isolated. It's focused on <laughs> selfishness. Yeah. Focused on lust. Mm -hmm. It's focused on greed and pride. Like, oh, this woman wants this man that other women will be jealous of. Yeah. This man wants this woman that other men will be jealous of. Mm -hmm. But then... Which means it's really just about you. It exactly. ain't got nothing to do with it. Ego, pride. But yet we say we're asking God for our partner. Mm -hmm. So there's... Because you brought that up, I heard this <laughs> story and... It's this guy who, there's two scenarios. So you can tell me about what is happening with these men because you tell the truth about what a man is actually thinking and experiencing and feeling, right? So this man is shorter than the woman that he's with and he prefers for her to walk into rooms ahead of him so that he can watch the expression of men as she walks in, like as they're looking at her. To me, that is insane. What is ha like? What is that? What's happening in his psyche that is telling him to let, like you're aroused by the expression of other men 
looking at your girl instead of just being aroused by her you're aroused by the looks of that they're giving her mm -hmm. what is that that is to <laughs> that, that's the validate that makes him six foot four mm, okay. so what he's doing is he's, he's allowing that, his yeah. woman to set the stage set the tone men say oh she pretty mm -hmm. and then when he come in there mighty might now he's like oh <laughs> It all to me like, whoa, that's your woman? So now he grows six inches because it says, hey, yes, I'm shorter than y'all, but look what I done did. Mm -hmm. Look at the woman I done pulled. So it's just insecurity. I feel like that ain't, now that you say it in that way, it's like kind of smart. It's insecurity. It's like, because don't let me walk in first and you start judging me. <laughs> Actually, I pulled that. So we can skip the height conversation. It's insecurity. I'm him. Men not going <laughs> to believe it, though. Yeah. Men, men don't believe that. Like men, we we judge it differently. So mm -hmm. we see a man who is shorter than what women say they desire. We assume he, he got has money. money. We assume he has money, or we assume he plucked her off a pole. Jesus, Tony. Yeah, like because it's a lot of men who they <laughs> get a woman. Yeah, plucked her off. Well, he could have walked her down the stairs. They yeah, have stairs a lot on of, the uh, stages. You're right. They don't he pluck. plucked off a pole. <laughs> It's a lot of men who marry or get a woman from the strip club or from pornography. And because that woman wants stability, she don't care how tall he is, what he look like, mm -hmm. nothing. And so when men, when we look at it, we like, okay, is this genuine? Is this real? Because mm -hmm. an exception to the rule would be they sat down and they talked and they really hit it off. Connected. Which and it, and it's has real. happened, right? Yes, that has happened. Okay, and that's okay. Yes, that happens. And, okay. and, but initially you're going to judge it and say okay let me look within mm -hmm. and see if this is genuine mm -hmm. does this woman really love this man mm -hmm. who she didn't have on her list i'm gonna be honest i've been to a few a few strip clubs and the i'm an observer so i like to sit back i don't always like to participate in things just in general but i like to sit back and like watch like, I like to just sit back and observe. I've been doing that on social media, too. Like, I don't like to participate, but I'll get on and just, like, observe what's going on. But when in strip clubs, like, the amount of men that are just sitting there talking to a stripper. She's not even really dancing on him. She might be sitting on his lap, but it's a lot of conversations. And I'm like... And these men are married. Some of, a lot of them are married. You don't want your wife to just do that? Like, you, you have gotten to a point where you are going to the strip club that has no, a place that has no windows. It's dark. You don't know what time of day it is. You don't know what it looks like outside. There's naked women around. And you came only to sit and talk to someone. Mm. Where, what, it, where, what are we missing? Or what are women missing that men are just looking for conversations because I think we think that they go to the strip club to fulfill a sexual thing. And it might be that a little bit, but from what I've seen, it's a lot of conversation. They just want someone to talk to them. Right. At least that's what it looks like. But, but you, it's not that. Yeah. A man don't talk for no reason. So it's really like if he talking is more so like, let me build a rapport so that I can get some private dances outside the club for a discount. He's not just in there just talking to be talking. And so, Got it. He's but, building rapport. See, I'm thinking he's lonely. No, no. Because he could talk he's to his homeboys. No, he could talk to his homeboys. He ain't lonely. But but sometimes... You get on a hotline. Okay, but listen. If I was a man, right? Mm -hmm. And for, for men, vulnerability is hard, right? Mm -hmm. I would find logic into going to a strip club and paying for a girl to sit here and talk to me because I don't ever have to see you again. And you really don't care. I just might need a woman to get that vulnerability out. You, you know, know what I mean? You know who Jeffrey Dahmer is? Jesus. That's the type of man that'll do that. Jesus Christ. If a man is Jeffrey? literally doing it for that reason, he is a psychopath. Literally. That, no. That's, that, that ha and see, but see, that's the thing. Is a lot of women try to think logically as if they were a man. Yeah, because you say women are very naive when it comes it, to men. The man will never do that. The benefit of the a doubt. man will never do that because 
he don't have to go to the strip club to talk to somebody. He he literally could go to the grocery store and I mean, people a whole conversation. That's perversion, and that's a sign of our society is in the toilet. Mm. The way men are so addicted to the strip club and addicted to pornography mm -hmm. is showing you when perversion, when lust is unleashed, mm -hmm. it can't be quenched. Mm. And so when a man is doing that, he goes, he recruits strippers, then they become his girlfriend or become his baby mother. And that's what they're trying to do. Mm. Let me go get this woman who is trained to seduce. Mm. So when you see this multimillionaire man who could have any woman and he's going to date exotic dancers, mm -hmm. now a lot of men say, but it's psychological. It ain't even about that she's a dancer. It's about these women are taught and train how to please a man, mm. how to stroke ego. Mm. So even the conversation with a dancer for that man is going to be different than the conversation with his wife. Yeah. Because your wife does not practice stroking your ego. Your wife going to be real with you. She's going to be blunt with you. Yes, she could be sexy or whatever, mm -hmm. but on the average, she's not sitting there, oh, you're just so smart. <laughs> Oh, you're just so amazing. But don't you think men need that? We do need from it. Our, from their women, they need, we do need that it. you're amazing. You're so great. We, they need the stroke we, of an ego. So what's the difference? But you don't want it from who you see as... Not your partner. The, the, the bottom part, of yeah. the totem pole. No. Like men objectify dancers. Mm -hmm. Dancers are not praised. Dancers are not put on a pedestal. Dancers are put on a pole mm -hmm. as an object of a man's lust. Mm -hmm. A man sees a dancer as a peasant, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that's why if I become president, I'm banning strip clubs. Not if I become president. Because it's just unhealthy. So <laughs> a man is not going to get his ego stroked mm -hmm. in the literal sense by someone he looks down on. Mm -hmm. that's literally just a play. But that's where we are as a society, and so it's normalized. Mm -hmm. And I think what we have to <clears throat> really think about is, is what we are normalizing. Pornography, threesomes, strip clubs, a man having a hall pass. Mm -hmm. Is what we are normalizing, is this truly normal? Yeah. Or are we perverted? Mm -hmm. And I think once we get there and we realize how perverted our society is, mm -hmm. because the thing about it is, and what I tell men all the time, would you preach this to your daughter? Yeah. Yeah. Would you let your daughter go be a dancer? Would you encourage your daughter to be a dancer? If nothing is wrong with it, send your daughter up there. Mm. If nothing is wrong with it, send your mama, your grandma, and your daughter. Jesus. And open. Not grandma. Yeah. Open the diamond club. I don't want grandma. And grandma, she the bottle server. Mama. Okay, grandma's she, a bottle. Uh -huh. she, the, she the top dancer. Okay. Daughter, she the backup dancer. Jesus. And if a man, if a man would say he wouldn't do that to women he know and love, mm -hmm. then that's where we see the hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. To where one man's daughter shouldn't be succumbed to being the object of a man's lust mm -hmm. and being treated like a piece of meat, whereas my daughter get to be working corporate as a Fortune 500 CEO. And that and it shouldn't be determined whether she had a father presently in her night, life or not. At the end of the day, exactly. she's a daughter. She is God's daughter. She, yeah. And so this is what I'm trying to work on is the correction of the mentality of men mm -hmm. to where we can come to a realization and realize how perverted life is. Yeah. I got in a lot of trouble the other day because I posted a, a, real, a, a short to men saying that if you watch porn mm -hmm. where the man is with the woman, you are into men. And the guys got mad at me because, <laughs> and the women say, well, Tony, that's 90% of men. I say, well, 90% of your men is into men because as a heterosexual male, I have no desire to see another man body part, his private area. But until but do you think that they're looking at it like that or they're, replacing they that guy with themselves and nope, fantasizing. That, that's, what, that's the lie they tell themselves. Okay, got it, got it. And that's the lie they tell you. That's they the lie, tell, you that's the lie they I'm tell not, they not every woman. But when you think about the mind, mm -hmm. 
The mind can't separate that. Mm -hmm. Anything the mind sees and conceives, it believes. Mm -hmm. So if you practice looking at another man's private area, just understanding how the mind works, you're going to eventually start to have visions mm. and desires. This is just me understanding the mind. I don't watch it. So yes. men thought, oh, you projecting. Oh, you speaking for yourself. No, I'm speaking for the mind. This mm -hmm. is how the mind works. Mm -hmm. you, we don't get the choice to separate the two. Yeah. That's why we have dreams based on what we've seen in the day or based on what we've seen in our life mm -hmm. because it works on its own. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is we're not putting a mirror in the face of society. Yeah. And we're not realizing how disgusting we are. Disgust. How lost we are. Mm -hmm. How perverted we are. Mm -hmm. And we are normalizing barbaric acts. Jesus. As something that is normal. But then we're trying to have a marriage and raise kids. Mm -hmm. But spiritually living like a demonic barbarian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is where it gets real at. Yeah. All right, you guys, before we continue on with this episode, this episode of In Totality is brought to you by L'Oreal Paris Bright Reveal Dark Spot Serum and Broad Spectrum SPF 50 Daily Lotion. Dark spots, game over. You guys, listen, ever since summer has ended, I've noticed an increase in these sunspots. The Bright Reveal Dark Spot Serum visibly fades all dark spots up to 40%, and after two weeks, skin looks clear. The serum has a top dermatologist recommended brightness ingredients that helps reduce the appearance of dark spots. If you guys want to get rid of your dark spots, SPF is so important because 100% of your dark spots are intensified by the sun. The Bright Reveal SPS 50 Daily UV Lotion is a lightweight and non-greasy sunscreen that has an invisible texture and it primes well with makeup so you can stay protected every day. The Bright Reveal SPF 50 Daily UV Lotion includes UVA and UVB filters to provide broad spectrum protection from UVA aging and UVB burning rays and antioxidants, vitamin C and E to help protect against environmental damage caused by free radicals. Listen guys, when paired together, this derm validated duo visibly reduces the look of dark spots in just one week. You heard me right, just one week. Discover the new Bright Reveal Dark Spot Duo. Visit Target online and in stores to buy yours today. All right, guys, back to the show. So I have another example, because it kind of falls along with what you're saying. So there's a guy who enjoys posting his girl with hardly any clothes on. But... The general consensus is is that he loves her and you know worships the ground. And she, he's just so proud of her. For me personally, and you can tell me what your thoughts are on this, but for me, it feels like a red flag for me when a man is so open with showing his woman's body like that. Um, I, for me, would not want to be with someone who, not that you're not proud of me, I'm not saying be like cover up from head to toe or whatever, but to constantly post and like promote my body, I think is kind of a red flag. It is, it's a huge, see that right there is a product of porn. Mm. I guarantee you that man has a, porn addiction mm. and he also is into men he go Tell both me. ways <laughs> and that's why he is so beholden it's not funny to the affection <laughs> of men he posting his woman and showcasing her to be praised by other men is it that yeah he, he no, wants people to be like man should... your girl bad man your girl bad but he does not have an understanding that what he's doing is showing his darkness. Mm. It's showing his behind the scenes. It's showing that he has a porn addiction. It's showing that he doesn't value a woman. Mm. He doesn't respect a woman. And we'll paint it as, oh, no, he just, that means he's secure. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that. Mm. It means that he is insecure. And that's why he is looking for 
those likes and that praise mm-hmm. and for people to so we'll spin that as security but really that right if i seen a man doing that it, it would, draw it would tell me yeah. that he doesn't value the body of a woman mm-hmm. and that behind closed doors he really want him a man jesus lord i mean i was with you at the doesn't value her he wants a man oh yeah you want your man that's and that's the thing that it's little signs like that and that we missing, but that is from perversion. Mm-hmm. It's from lust being unquenched. And that's why I teach men, we have to consecrate our spirit. Mm-hmm. We have to have discipline. Yeah. We have to have self-control. That's the thing that always bugs me about that type of conversation when it comes to like the high value man and how he's going to have multiple women and da 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 And I'm just like, how can you be so disciplined in the areas of your career or, you know, training for a sport or doing any of those, how can you be so disciplined in that and refuse to be disciplined in the sense of getting your needs met by only one woman? But I, I'm under, like, it's such a conversation and it's such a, um, an obsession with, the idea of multiple partners and mul- or just the idea of just not being accountable to one person. I don't think our, our society and culture wants to be accountable to anyone, whether in a relationship, whether in a religion, whether in a job, like no one wants to be accountable or, or, or just accountable to anybody. They want to make their own decision and do whatever they want to do whenever they feel like they want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is not just in relationships. That's not just within men or not just with, I think that is across the board. And it's a, and it's a, the idea of lust, not in just a sexual way, but just the desire for more for you, me, me, me like this. I want, I want more likes, more subscribers, more money, more women, more men, more opportunity, more platform. Like, it's just the wanting of of more. Right. Addiction. I think that's, yeah, the addiction of it. We are an addicted society. Yeah. We're addicted to the dopamine release. We're addicted to the oxytocin release. Mm-hmm. And what we're not understanding is that we're not self-regulating. Yeah. With things that move the story forward. But as long as the brain releases into the bloodstream that high, then anything will do. Yeah. And so men who have multiple women, and I was that guy. Before Mm -hmm. I got married, I was out there. But I was doing it because this is what I thought a man should do. Mm -hmm. But in that process, there was no, there was pleasure, but it was no happiness. Mm -hmm. And it really was no pleasure because pleasure doesn't lead to happiness. It leads to pain. Mm. So I was checking off the boxes and I was really appealing to other men. Mm. And that's why men do it. It's not even about the woman. Yeah. Because when you really are honest with yourself, you understand that that act is to reproduce. Mm-hmm. Like there's nothing cute about private areas. <laughs> it's not like this is the most beautiful thing. 100%. They're you not see what that I mean? attractive. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So when we really honest, this is for a purpose. But mm-hmm. when men are promoting it, it's really a sign of brokenness, mm. a sign of insecurity, a sign of spiritual loneliness mm-hmm. that is going unaddressed. Yeah. And then a man is saying, no, I'm doing this because I want to. I'm doing this because this is the nature of a man. The nature of a man is to be fruitful and replenish the earth. Mm-hmm. But that is with one woman. Mm. Because when you do that with multiple women, now you're playing with hearts. you also playing with STDs. And you playing with demons and all kind of spirits. Mm -hmm. So we have to really get to the root of it and be honest about it. But at the same time, it's too, it's too real for us because it's 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 a shock to the system. Yeah. Yeah. It's too, it's so much. It's like we're trying to take these baby steps and even the men who sound good and who may look good to women and may have money Mm -hmm. and you'll see some of those guys out there who seem like they have it together but even those men are still struggling to find a wife Mm -hmm. they're struggling to get over their ego get over themselves and to find a wife 
receive that favor from God. And I look around at different guys who I see like doing podcasts and I'm like, okay, you single, mm -hmm. you don't have kids, you have money. Mm -hmm. What's like, the problem? What's the problem? Like, why can't you pick a wife? But do you feel like every man needs to be married? If not, he needs to live like Apostle Paul. Because if he's not married, but yet he is still, because what you got to realize before we had a piece of paper, mm -hmm. nobody had, yeah. Sex was a covenant. Mm -hmm. When a man, and the Bible said they came together. Mm -hmm. When you come together, that's your woman. That sealed the deal. Yep. So if a man is not abstaining, then he's doing damage. Mm. He's doing the work of the devil. Mm. So if a man is sleeping with a woman, but not married to that woman or marrying that woman, not married to her, he's doing the work of the adversary. Mm. Because now what does this woman have? She has a spiritually transmitted disease. She has a spiritually transmitted demon. Mm. And if he's doing this with multiple women, she has a sexually transmitted disease. Mm. Then she may next have a baby out of wedlock mm -hmm. and with a weekend dad. So yeah. a man may say marriage isn't for everybody. What? But if he's sleeping around, then he's saying pain is for everybody. Mm. Loneliness is for everybody. Me breaking a woman's heart, me leading her on. Because you know how a lot of women, even if a man says, I don't want a woman, mm -hmm. the woman feels like she could change him. Mm -hmm. That when she's intimate with him and she's cooking for him and mm -hmm. she's speaking life into him, that it's going to make him choose her. Mm -hmm. And yet she's left broken, hurting and confused. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I really don't deal with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, the men that I'm around are men who are pursuing purpose, men who want excellence, mm -hmm. men who want to tackle those tough areas in the dark. Yeah. Men who want to grow. So why don't you feel like, because your content is, your listeners are mainly women. So why are men so opposed to this conversation? Men aren't opposed to it. And the listeners are men as well. Okay. The subscribers are not men. Mm -hmm. the so they follow, don't want to see nobody. Men and see everything. Men are like, I don't want nobody to know I'm, I'm exactly. watching this. Men okay. see everything women see. Mm -hmm. But a man knows when he's ready mm -hmm. and he knows when he's not ready. And men, we only allow certain men to speak into our life. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is, is I don't show the benefits and the rewards of living the life that I live. And the reason why I don't show it is because I serve Christ, mm -hmm. which is a through line of humility. Yeah. But what men who live the life, like sleeping with a lot of women, a lot of times those men also show the Rolexes and yeah. the Bentleys and all of those things. Mm -hmm. Now, I have all of those things, but if you scroll my timeline, you won't see that I also could fly private. Mm -hmm. And I also have... Bentleys and Range Rovers mm -hmm. and fancy watches, but men associate things and worldly success as this is the blueprint. Mm -hmm. This is the life to live. Mm -hmm. And I, I struggle <laughs> with that because as a Christian, you're not supposed to worship mammon or yeah. focus on material things, but we live in a material world. Yeah, It's a balance. And I remember a 24 year old guy, young brother. He said, Tony, you know, we were talking on a coaching session. And somehow he was like, well, you know, what kind of thing, like cars do you have? And I, and I listed out the cars. And he was like, man, I did not know that. Mm. He was like, I need to see that, man. He said, I need to see you post your Bentley. Mm. He was like, because I'm seeing these guys over here with the Bentleys and the Maseratis mm. and the Range Rovers. I ain't know you had all the same stuff mm. and you married and faithful. He's like, I need to see a representation in the world that I could live I right and agree. do the right yeah, thing. I agree with that. And still have the things I desire. Yeah. And I think that it's the heart posture that matters. I think that I don't think that you have the heart posture to flaunt it in the sense of look what I've got, look what I got. I think that you have the heart posture to you know, point in the direction of the one who gave it to you, the one who provides for you, the one who, 
you know what I mean? So I think the heart posture matters, but I would, I agree. I get that. Cause I, we had this whole conversation last night about, you know, the integrity in me and, and me and you have had this conversation too. Cause you believe that I could do some things that I don't always believe that I can do. And you think that they could be very lucrative and those things scare me only because I'm like, I take the gift that we have to inspire people or to impact them. I take that with very high regard and reverence. And so living well off of not the pain of people, but like them needing hope and them needing inspiration, that always feels weird to me. Like that, the idea of that feels weird. But when when I hear that young guy say to you, I need to see that. I need to see that you can still be successful and be married and faithful. I need. I think that that is important too. So it's like, how do you find that balance? Well, the thing is, is you are struggling. You're listening to Satan's narrative mm-hmm. of godly <laughs> success. Mm-hmm. So you worded it the way satan's minions comment to us Mm -hmm. and say you're benefiting off of the pain of people Mm -hmm. but that's not what you're doing Mm -hmm. if you write a book telling your story a book goes into a marketplace you can't post a book on amazon for free not so much the book but the coaching part of it i think that's the thing that really but well that still is a marketplace yeah because coaching and consulting, you have three kids and four, if you count, you know, Jordan, mm-hmm. like you, you helping her. Mm-hmm. So if you give eight hours a day coaching people through their mess and they don't even want to change sometimes, they just mm-hmm. want to talk to you. Because a lot of times when people tell somebody something, mm-hmm. they feel like they've solved the problem, but <laughs> then they go right back to it. Mm-hmm. So for the value you're bringing and for your time, mm-hmm. you have to put a price on it. Otherwise, you're going to be in a poor house. Yeah. Maybe but, it's just the timing. I think it's the timing and feeling like I can bring value to you in the midst of me still trying to figure out, you know, where I am and and allowing God to lead me in this new journey, in this new chapter. Like, still feeling, like, even doing this, I felt like, if I'm being honest, my thought was like, I have a problem with processes. I love processes. I love, you know, it's a process. I love processes being in place. I hate them when it comes to me. My, to me. I hate a process when it comes to me. Like the idea that God will be like, here, go do this. And I feel so incomplete in the sense of like, I'm still learning, I'm still growing, I'm still finding out things, I'm still developing better practices and better obedience. And you know what I mean? I'm still, I feel like I'm still learning. And so I feel like I'm, I guess it's like the complete thing. Like I feel like I, he needs to complete me before I can be used for any good. And I know that that's not true, but that's the reality of how like I, I have very high reverence for representing him in any type of way. Like, I don't want to play around with that. You know what I mean? Right. So I feel like I want to be complete, but I know that's not a reality. You should have that reverence and you should have trembling fear of the Lord Mm -hmm. and reverence of the Lord. But at the same time, you have to remember that he does qualify us to go where he calls us to. Mm -hmm. And that we will never fully be 100%. Yeah. And so therefore, you become the one-eyed woman in the land of the blind, which in essence, what that means is when you take a step and you step in a pothole and you sprain your ankle, when you brush yourself off and you get up, now you can create a road map mm-hmm. to say right here there's a detour mm-hmm. right here there's a pothole mm-hmm. right here there's a roadblock yeah but yeah. the marketplace has a price for that map yeah and people 
who want to get where you have gotten to, they understand that they have to invest in themselves mm -hmm. by paying you for your time and your sacrifice because that is taking time from other things that you could be doing. Mm -hmm. So you can't feel inadequate. Yeah. But you also have to listen to your spirit and know when, when it's time. time. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. Because when you feel completely in disarray and discombobulated, that's not the time. It's not the time. Yeah. Do you ever take seasons away? I do all coaching? the time. Do you? I close my uh, Is it coaching like a every regular year. time every year? No, it's not. Okay. It's just listening to my okay. spirit. Mm -hmm. And so right now I'm coaching people and I coach. I cut off Mondays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays. I don't coach. I coach Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. And those sessions are draining. And that's why I take time off. And then I will, I've closed now sessions to new clients mm -hmm. at my discounted rate. Mm -hmm. And then if someone is, when someone writes in and they're a new client, just because I'm called to serve, it's like I still can't turn them down. Mm -hmm. But because it's my off season, there's a higher rate. Mm -hmm. So I send them to my mentor.life where they can book me there and it's a higher rate. But I will sacrifice and do a video session versus just on phone. Mm -hmm. And so when you're a servant, we cannot forget that when the lady pulled the hem of Jesus' garment, he asked his disciple, who touched me? Who touched mm -hmm. me? And, and the semblances of that is when you're giving of yourself, it's going to drain you. Mm -hmm. Something will leave your body. Mm -hmm. Something will leave you. That is the purpose of service. Yeah. And that's why the meek shall inherit the earth. Yeah. That's why the humble will be exalted publicly. Yeah. Because when you are truly a servant, there's times to where we give when we still don't have it all figured out. Yeah. And when God calls you into certain places in certain seasons, not everyone can go. Yeah. Because not everyone's spirit is willing to be consecrated. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you have to feel. And I feel like that's for everybody who even sees this, mm -hmm. that we have to know that nothing God calls us to will be painless. Yeah. yeah. It's excruciating pain. Excruciating. And I think that it's important to, you know, have the knowledge and understanding that he's with you and he's for you. And I think that in any season where there's relationship strains or, you know, breakups or whether it's marriage or whatever it is, re business relationships, platonic relationships, whatever, boyfriend, girlfriend relationships, whatever, that it's such a crucial time to know that God is with you because the way the enemy is going to attack your mind by stating facts. You know what I mean? It's not like he's always lying. Like the Bible says he stands and accuses us day and night, but if he's in the presence of God, he can't lie. So he's saying things that are true. He's accusing us with the truth or, or saying things that are facts and accusing us with facts. But the truth is, is that if you are in Christ Jesus, you're a new creature. Like that's the truth, regardless of what you've done in the past, that is the truth. And I think reminding, I have to always be mindful to remind myself of the truth, regardless of the pain of the facts. And coming into this situation, regardless of how I came here, it was still painful because I never pictured myself doing the number one, doing this publicly, but ne number two, doing it by myself. You know what I mean? But the type of intimacy that it creates with me and God is something I've never experienced before because he has my full and utter attention in every way where before I think, you know, when you get so comfortable leaning on someone else, you forget the one who you're supposed to be utterly dependent on. You know what I mean? And, you know, it's painful. I can't pretend that it's easy. You know what I mean? And I think that it would, it would be, you know, 
I guess normal, I guess to in today's society to just act like it's whatever and it didn't matter and it didn't hurt or it didn't, and that's not true. Like the truth of the matter is it was extremely painful. The truth of the matter is, is that I didn't want to do this by myself. But the truth is also that I believe that God is with me and that he's called me to do this. And if he's for me, it doesn't matter what's against me, not even myself. It doesn't matter what fear, you know, comes up as long as he's with me. Um, so, but navigating through that is not the easiest thing. And the enemy, when I think of all these ideas that I have or, you know, how I want to expand this, the enemy's like, mm, are you really ready to do that? Should you be doing that? What would they think? What would they say? And it's like, that can't be what God, I can't think that God would say that. He wouldn't. And the thing about it is no one sees anything of you other than servanthood, other than grace, other than poise. So you are putting your grace up for crucifixion and you're removing grace from your life. And you think that we see you the way you see you, mm -hmm. but what you see in you is oftentimes what the adversary is trying to make you believe. Yeah. So when he's speaking to you, he's not actually speaking your truth. Mm -hmm. It's coming from a different space, the same way he approached Jesus. And yeah. he tried to tell him, yeah. hey, you know, jump from here because it says this mm -hmm. and not even a foot or dash that rock. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had to tell him it is written. Yeah. Do not tempt God. Mm -hmm. And so you have to remember that. And I know because when somebody knows their walk and who they talk to and who they spend time with, I know my walk with God. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I know that you could be called but you're going to be in intense spiritual warfare mm -hmm. and you will be in that battle. And in those times, you got to remember the people that God has crossed your path and connected you to mm -hmm. who have his ear and he has their ear. Mm -hmm. So the very first time it all made sense is in essence, God was saying, go get my daughter mm -hmm. because I DM you mm -hmm. and said, Hey, I want to come on your show. Mm -hmm. And then when I came on your show, we spoke life. Mm -hmm. And then not long after that, mm -hmm. this right here happened. And then we were able to have conversations that are God-centered yeah. and spirit-filled. Yeah. And when God is in the midst, because very rarely can men and women have conversation and it not get messy and it not get outside of the will of God. Because mm -hmm. we see that happen a lot. Mm -hmm. So when we're able to have those God-centered conversations... And know that this conversation is purposeful and intentional, mm -hmm. but it ain't like, oh, we friends and we just buddy buddy and we kicking it and we just playing around. No, this is about business yeah. and this is about kingdom business. Yeah. And every single text got to move the story forward. Yeah. It ain't just shooting the breeze. Hey, how's the sun? Yeah. How's the sky? Yeah. And so you have to realize that you are called. And to everybody who watching this, if you see this and you are here, know that if you speak against what is trying to go forward, that you have to be held accountable for that. Know that when you are dealing with somebody in the presence of their purpose and their calling, that you have to tread lightly. And when it says, touch not my anointing and do my prophet no harm, it's not just to say that any and everybody who has a microphone is called. But what it's to say is that sometimes people are given from their brokenness. Sometimes mm -hmm. people are serving from their desolation or their isolation where they really don't know what's going to happen next. So be mindful of how you speak. Be mindful of how you address and make sure that you speak in life because at the end of the day, it's not the person you're speaking to, you're talking to God mm -hmm. because God is watching you and God knows your heart. And so in that, you have to stop judging yourself and you have to be able to accept the call and know that with the call, because Jesus said it himself, mm -hmm. he said, they hated me. They hate me. So they will hate you. Mm -hmm. And so when I say something that God has ordained and everybody in the comments misses it, 
then I know I'm not talking to his children. Mm -hmm. I know I'm not talking to the ones who have accepted the calling. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what you have to realize. Yeah. And this will assume the position in the kingdom that it has been ordained for. Mm -hmm. It's not about replacing anybody, mm -hmm. removing anybody, but accepting your place at God's table. Yeah. That will be prepared in front of your enemies. Mm. And if you allow the adversary to succeed with making you double-minded, which is his sole goal, mm -hmm. only to make you double-minded. And as the Bible says, a double-minded man receives nothing from the Lord. Mm. So in that doubt, in that guilt, in that fear, in that double-mindedness, is only to cause just a tinge of hesitation mm -hmm. and doubt. Because according to your faith, be it unto you. Mm -hmm. The adversary knows that if he can have you resting in doubt and fear and guilt, yeah. that God will not move. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but when you surrender and you trust him fully, yeah. it's going to blow your mind. Yeah. And that's why I don't show the blessings or even really talk about it because it's, it's mind boggling. Yeah. It's overwhelming. A person can't even really hear the blessings of God and not see it as bragging. Yeah. I feel like it's in the internal thing. Sometimes it's not even like the the manifestation of something like that blows your mind. Like what has been blowing my mind, I guess, lately is the peace that I've had. Like. And see, and and I know that if this was any other season, I probably would be a wreck. But the more that I'm seeking him and the more that I'm listening to him and the more that I'm reading his word, it's like the less that anxiety is is prevalent, the less that depression is there. The less now I have my moments, I ain't gonna lie, like I've had some moments, but those are the things that are like mind blowing to me that when an attack comes, I've a I'm able to still get out of my bed. You know what I mean? Like those are the things that I'm like, dang, bro, that is, cause I know if this was last year, I know if this was the year before, we would not be sitting here. You know what I mean? So those are the things that to me are like, and they ha and there have been blessings, monetary blessings. There have been things that are also mind blowing, but it's more of the internal things that are happening. It's how I'm seeing it change Jordan. It's how I'm seeing it change Jay. Like the impact that it's having on them, it, how it's spreading externally and what it's doing, how the conversations I'm having with my kids, like all of it's those things that are like, yeah, that's what I want. The, the money and stuff that's going to come and I'm, grateful for it you know but it's not even about the money yeah i can sleep at night like that's the peace yeah that passive all understanding yeah. and that's that's what people can't wrap their mind around yeah is that when they give it a try and they tap into that space of being all the way in yeah with god that peace is in the midst of the storm yeah so even in your battles and in your moments don't allow the adversary to allow you to think that the moment is him winning. Mm -hmm. Instead, the moment is you being purged. Mm -hmm. The moment is you being purified. Mm -hmm. The moment is the spirits of the adversary leaving you. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, you're not dying. In that moment, you're not losing. You're living. Mm -hmm. You're winning. You're gaining. But birth is painful. Yeah. And that's what we have to remember. Yeah. <sighs> this was a good episode. I feel like, oh, we have a voicemail? Okay. Well, before we go, we're going to listen to a voicemail that I got. And if you are subscribed to my Patreon, you could possibly be on the show. Just send me a voicemail. It's really me. It comes straight to my phone. You can send me a text, a voice note, a voicemail, um, whatever you want to do. 
and uh, I'll play it on the episode and I'm going to answer your question if you have one and hopefully um, we can bring some value and um, insight to your question. So this is from Chantel. Um, I don't I don't have her last name, but this is from Chantel. So Chantel, thanks for. Hey, friend. Uh, this is Chantel, and my question is: Navigate in a season where I'm like trying to fix posture. It's like in my mind, I know my heart posture is not correct, and I'm trying to fix it. But I, I don't know. I just still have like I don't know. Like my heart posture is just bitter, and I just want to know how do I navigate this season? I'm fixing my heart posture because I'm struggling with my posture right now. Thank you, friend. Love you. <laughs> First of all, she tells it, I need you to know this is about the posture. <laughs> she said, I am struggling with my posture because my heart posture ain't posturing. I get it, girl. <laughs> I get it. Listen, I think that like, you know how like everyone kind of has like a life message. I feel like heart posture is part of my life message. Like it is the most important thing to me um, and not because I always have the right heart posture. It's because I know my heart posture has been so trash in so many ways. And the last six months of my life, God has literally like, and I, when I, I people think that I sound crazy when I say that I was telling Jordan, I was like, I literally sometimes feel like I can feel my heart turning. Like I can feel it. I don't even know how to explain it, but it's like you get Jay over here shaking his head. He's like, yeah, that's what happens. But you like you can feel this like complete shift in your heart and so I'm very passionate about heart posture so I wanted to preface it by saying that because I don't want my tone to come off condemning because it's not that or like oh you know it all because it's not that either I just have been through enough um and have been disobedient enough to where I know my heart posture wasn't where God wanted it to be but there are so many things that intrigue me about the heart and um, spiritually and just physically. And the Bible is so explicit about your heart. And one of my favorite, not favorite scriptures, but a reference that I always go to where it says the heart is deceitful above all, like who can know it but God. And we hear commonly, follow your heart just whatever your heart says. And it's like, I don't think we realize that our heart is such a deceptive thing. And you will not even realize the posture of your heart because you've convinced yourself that you're good when you don't really look at, like what defines the correct heart posture. And I think that that's something that you would have to ask yourself when trying to take inventory of your heart what defines that for you? What is a the standard on a good heart posture? Because in today's society, it's like, just be nice, I guess. You know, be nice. Right. Say please and thank you. And you have a beautiful heart because you, you walk in a room and, and you smile and, you know, and I'm not saying people who walk in a room and smile and say, please and thank you, don't have a right heart posture. But I think it's important to know how to define that. Um, for me, Chantel, that is defined by God's word. My heart posture is defined because he is explicit, very clear. There's no room for interpretation. He is very clear on how our heart should be postured. And it's always in the posture of him and the direction of him. And doing that means obedience, right? So when it says forgive and we pick and choose how we forgive and when we forgive, we don't have the right heart posture. It says forgive, period. There is no but if, if they, that, but that, that. no, forgive, forgive. Forgive them, bless them, give, cheerfully give. Like there are so many explicit things that define what our heart posture should be. So for me, like I said, I'm going to define that by, the, by God's word. I think it's important that whoever is listening to this, you find how to define that for yourself. That's my answer. I don't know what your answer is. That's power. That's a word. That is a word. 
what I would say, what I did is I stopped looking without and started looking within. Mm -hmm. So what that means is we have to stop letting social media use us and we got to use it. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times when we bitter, it's because we're watching. Mm. We're watching and we're comparing instead of counting our blessings and being grateful. Mm -hmm. So when I stop comparing my life and I start appreciating the season that I'm in and where God has me, it changed my heart's posture. So now I don't have to be jealous of this other person because I don't know what they're going through. I don't know if what I'm looking at is real. But what I do know is that God has me and he has me covered mm -hmm. and that he can grant me peace and prosperity in my mind and that I have a lot to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. So bitterness in your heart comes from a lack of gratitude mm -hmm. and it comes from a lack of being in God. Mm -hmm. And so even when your heart is in a posture of sternness and firmness, like when Jesus flipped over the tables, mm -hmm. the question has to be asked is, do I want what God wants? Mm -hmm. And if we want what God wants, because I'm very hard, I'm very direct, I'm very, very real. But my question is, is, is this of God? Mm -hmm. Am, do I want what God wants mm -hmm. for the people, for the kingdom? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, then I know my heart is in the right place. Yeah. If I ask myself that question and the answer is, uh, no, you jealous or no, you insecure or no, you angry or no, you're mad that you're not here or you're not there, mm -hmm. then my heart is in the wrong place. Yeah. And God dealt with me probably like, 2012 2010 2012 in that season mm -hmm. of like comparing yeah and wanting someone else's perceived blessings and perceived platform or position mm -hmm. instead of just being appreciative of where he has us and us being yeah. willing to harvest you know to grow right where we are planted yeah versus comparing i think that to to a good way to kind of check if you are a believer, because I'm I'm not always assuming that I'm speaking to believers, but if you are a, a believer, I think it's important to ask yourself, identify the thing that you want the most, and then imagine if God says no, what's your response? That's a good place, a good indicator of where your heart posture is. Because if you're hesitant and you're like, well, well that's a good check, it's a good bag. It's a good opportunity. But if God says no, what is your immediate reaction? Is it to say, okay, okay, you said no. The answer is no. Or is it to be like, God, please, but, but is, it, is it to get him to change his mind? Or is it, is it to just be obedient? And I think for me, I always have, I kind of have to do those mental checks. Like, okay, if God say no, what you, what you, you, know, what you gonna say? That's a good way to know where your heart is at. Yeah, right. And so what I do with everything, like right now I got some on the line, and I'm like, Lord, if it's your will. Mm -hmm. I don't get excited about it. Mm -hmm. I can't plan for it. Lord, if it's your will. Yep. And when I release that, and I'm no longer connected to the answer or yep. the it's outcome. It's so much freedom. It's just like, if it's your yep. will. If it is not your will, let it slip through my grasp yes, and give me the peace to deal with it. Yep. Yep. I think that that's the most effective <laughs> prayer that you can pray. Your will. And like you said, not even getting excited about it, but just being obedient to that. If it's God's will, I'll be sitting here in 20 years. Maybe not in this space, but I'll be here talking to you in 20 years. If it's his will, if it's his will that I'm here for a little while and go and do something else and that's his will. But like either way, I'm after that. I'm after his will. That's where my heart is postured. And I think, too, you have to understand that posturing your heart is anchoring it. Like once you have decided to turn your heart towards him, you have to anchor it there. Because the heart is just, it's a deceitful thing, which means that it can move, which means that th the second it's pulled on, it'll go in wherever direction it's pulled. But if you anchor it in the posture that's pointing in his direction and you're putting it in that way and anchoring it there, it don't matter what comes. 
Depression might try to pull you, but you ain't turning because you're anchored. Anxiety might try to pull you, but you're not turning towards anxiety because you're anchored. And so, yes, it's important that you change and turn and posture yourself right. But then once that posture gets, once you get his eye and your gaze is on him, you better anchor yourself there by any means necessary. And I'm not even talking, I ain't even being light on that. By any means necessary. You cut off whatever relationship has to be cut off. You say no to whatever opportunity that's going to pull you away or unanchor you from him. The heart posture is very important because the Bible also says from the heart flows the, the, the issues of life. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's so important that we steward this thing that God created. It's important that we steward it well and be very mindful of it because it is so deceptive. You might be gone and don't even know it. You just think I'm a good, uh, of course I'm good with God. I'm a good person. Okay. Mm. That is dangerous. I'm telling you, I can't add nothing to that. Okay. We wrapped it up, we <laughs> closed it. We... Told you that I wrapped it up and closed it. All right, well, listen, I am so excited that you were my first guest. Um, I'm sure people will see us together more in the future. Um, yeah, y'all let her know if you want me to come back. I'm sure everyone will say yes because they, they've done that before. No, a couple they of them. Did, <laughs> no, a lot of people did. They wanted you back. But um, thank you. Thank you for helping me in this season too and um, encouraging me and, like, you know, just kicking me in the butt sometimes and – you know, kind of hard on me sometimes, but I appreciate it because it's helpful. And um, I'm excited about what's next. Awesome. I'm excited. If you let him, he's going to use you. <laughs> and, and it's going to blow your mind. Tony is always like, if. There's an if. Always. If. I know. I'm going to be obedient. Do you have anything? Com what do you have going on? What do you have coming up? I know we were... We talked about relationships, but we didn't talk about you and what you have going on. And Nothing. I'm here. I'm here. This is it. He's you know. a mystical it's all creature I, that's right. doing things behind the scenes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm present. This is the purpose. Yeah. You know, I don't want to promote nothing. Okay. This is the purpose. Really. Okay. Well, make sure you guys, I'm sure he has probably 20 other books that's coming out before the end of the year. <laughs> make sure you guys check at him out and his social media platform support, obviously. Um, make sure you comment, like, and subscribe. Uh, make sure you share it. That is the best form of uh, advertisement is you sharing this. If there's something, anything that we spoke in these last two episodes that you feel like is beneficial to somebody that you know, a loved one, a friend, a coworker, whoever, send it over to them. And then make sure you head over to my Patreon. There is so much exclusive content coming out and I don't want you to miss it um and yeah I'll see you guys next time